right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the third ETA on lecture uh, in the ETA on series, where from the Institute of Technology and Architecture we want to present and discuss um, topics with you that go beyond just technology, but concern all aspects of architectural design, urban design, society, and of course technology, as this is our field we are rooted in. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Sascha Rösler, who is currently a visiting professor and visiting fellow at ITER at the Institute of Technology and Architecture. Um, he has been quite related with the Institute for a while, um, going back quite far. Currently, he's a SNSF professor um, at uh, the University in Mendrisio, um, and professor for architecture and theory. Um, and he does a very interesting research in the intersection of climate, energy, comfort, and, and history and architectural theory. And this is why I think what he will present today is very relevant for us. Uh, he's been also involved at the Future Cities Lab in Singapore with ETH, and he did his PhD at ETH. Um, beyond that, he was uh, engaged um, in a range of uh, very renowned publications also were nominated for several awards so he's very well known for publishing um, excellent books and we're very happy to have him here today to share some insights on urban climate which is a very pressing topic um, and, and maybe today we can make the link on issues on urban climate and maybe also uh, what this means um, for future urban development and design maybe also in context of the situation we're in right now uh, which is a pandemic situation that has also implications on, on how we think of cities in the future. And uh, Sasha has also voiced some interesting ideas to that. But now, very much interested uh, to hear about urban climate from Sasha. Sasha, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and we'll hand over to you. Maybe you want to share your screen? Yes, of course. Just a second. Um... Maybe as a, as a side comment, um, you're all welcome to already pose questions in the chat. Using the chat function at the end then of the talk, we can collect and I will moderate a little bit the questions. But if something pops up, uh, feel free to uh, post it in the chat and then we can pick it up in the discussion afterwards. Hey, thank you so much, Arno, and thank you so much, uh, the ITA community. Welcome to, to this lecture. It's really um, a great pleasure to finally having the opportunity to pre present what we are doing in, Med in Mendrisio, but also beyond. And it's obviously uh, related to the topic of urban climate issues. And uh, today uh, I would like to take the opportunity to really introduce in this project, as you have heard, it's uh, a long-term research project related to a Swiss National Science Foundation professorship. We are a small team of researchers, so not only me, but uh, two doctoral students, Dalila Gottban and Lionel Epine, and two postdocs, Madeleine Kobe and Lorenzo Stieger, who are also part of this endeavor. And uh, so um, here's the overview of what I'm going to do. I basically would like to present the two trajectories of our research project. The, the first one um, is basically a history of ideas promoting design-based approaches to urban climate. And the second one highlights four case study cities uh, all over the world. And one is in, located in China and I will present this particular case study in the second part of my uh, presentation. But I will start with some more general remarks on, let's say, the global contexts and, and also uh, issues of the design, the design methodology related to this topic of urban climate. So let me start with these preliminary remarks on wicked problems in architecture and then followed by the two parts of, uh, by the introduction of the two parts of our project. So wicked problems in architecture, as you all know, we are, uh, of course, encountering uh, 
new types of challenges in architecture, but also in theory, architecture is facing challenges such as currently, of course, the coronavirus, but also um, as a long term problem, we could say climate change, uh, global migration issue, digitization. So really large topic challenging the current state also, the current state of thinking in architecture. So and there are new horizons also of architectural experimentation. I don't have to explain that to you, of course. Uh, we are talking about new forms of digital fabrication and also associated with new technologies and media such as machine learning, etc. And then, of course, um, much more related maybe to what we are doing, uh, sustainability and new types of political ecologies, which require new forms of research, which also challenges the epistemological framework, let's say, of, of, of architectural research. And uh, which implies in a certain way, I think also new links between the academia and the profession or between theory and practice. And I must say, I'm really happy, so happy to, to be at the ETA and it's great to have this uh, constant exchange with you guys. So to, to kind of frame these new challenges, we could, for instance, refer to the umbrella term of the risk society as it was promoted by a German sociologist, uh, Ulrich Beck, already in the mid 1980s and also promoting uh, a new type of modernity and um, kind of reflecting the outcome, the result of rapid modernization. But uh, in this case, I, I would like to much more relate these uh, global topics to the framework of design methodology. We already heard one presentation, uh, the one of uh, Petra batke uh, which from Delft University, so also talking about design methodology. And I think it makes sense to also discuss these broader uh, issues in the framework of a design methodology. So we could ask ourselves, what is a problem in architecture today? Is it still designing a building exclusively at least? And what means problem solving? Is it still exclusively constructing a building? In general, I think um, there's certainly a new awareness for complex problems in architecture, aggregated uh, problems in architecture coined by conditions of uncertainty, of dilemmas and risks, both in society and architecture. And design thinking can certainly help to kind of tackle these complex aggregated problems and also relying of collaborative decision-making processes. So um, being maybe also interdisciplinary in its scope. And so when it comes to design thinking and also these complex problems, um, it makes sense to, uh, to refer to an important and influential article uh, written by the design theoricians Horst Rittel and Melvin Weber at the beginning of the 1970s, Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning, where these two guys introduced this notion of wicked problems. And I would like to quickly remind you in in the basic meaning of this term wicked problem. So I will present you a quick reading of, of this article. So first of all, uh, Rittel and Weber differentiated two terms. You might be familiar with it. Uh, tame problems on the one hand and wicked problems on the, on the other hand. Traditionally, the planning disciplines are focused on tame problems, or we could also say planning disciplines tend to tame the real complexity of problems. That's how they described it and saw it. So planning is usually conceived as a process of designing problem solutions. As you all know, this is the modern classical model of planning. And along with it, uh, there's a, let's say an entire attitude, the belief in the makeability, the belief in the betterment, the idea of professionalism in contradistinction to the insights or the perceptions, pers the perspectives of laymen, the idea of efficiency, and of course, also the system approach. And all this, of course, coined also urban planning throughout the 20th century. So the, 
the contemporary city and the contemporary urban society, as they say, stand as clean evidences of professional prowess. On the other hand, uh, the wicked problem or the wicked problems in, in, in plural. So um, here in this case, new modes of reasoning come into the game, which are kind of questioning uh, the tra traditional, uh, let's say, arguments relying on scientific discourses. So wicked problems are extending the mere scientific scope of problem solving. They talk um, about a model of planning as an argumentative process in the course of which an image of the problem and of the solution emerges gradually among the participants. So uh, many different stakeholders and participants are involved in this process of communication of language. So wicked problems are kind of evolving out of a constant um, um, process of argumentation, as they say. And here in the last section, you see the classical definition of the wicked problem as they were uh, formulating it. And I will quickly read it. So to find the problem is not the same thing as finding the solution. The problem can't be find, defined until the solution has been found. The formulation of a wicked problem is the problem. So, um, this, what is interesting and sometimes not really uh, considered uh, sufficiently from my perspective is the broader historical and social context when Melvin Weber and Paul Strittel were writing their uh, paper. So, and the context was the early 1970s when the emergence of a new plurality of publics as social context of planning as they were describing it. And based on these developments, the epistemic boundaries of the problem of or of a problem are not clearly any longer definable since a, a wide array of social problems are involved, as they say. So they talk about intergroup conflicts, for instance, embedded in urban renewal. But they talk also, and this is quite remarkable about urban climate issues as exemplary uh, for um, a wicked problem. So they talk about the current concerns with environmental quality and with the qualities of urban life. They talk about air pollution. So um, I think um, uh, urban climate is indeed an exemplary wicked problem, not following the problem solving rationale we could say of the modern classical model of planning. And let me uh, refer also to another paper, a diagram from another paper, Scott Campbell's diagram indicating the different uh, goals, conflicting goals of planning, namely to provide at the same time a green city and the growing city and the just city. So he talks about the development conflict, the resource conflict, and the property conflict. So it's not so easy to uh, protect the environment and at the same time also provide equal opportunities for everybody. And um, so let me illustrate and now more focusing also on urban climate issues. Here is an image from Beijing, China, but it's not a recent image from the COVID-19 uh, times, but it's just an ordinary day during winter in Beijing. So um, it, here's, of course, here in, in, in Beijing, uh, people encounter enormous amounts of smog air pollution, of course, due to the heating practices and also due to the uh, industries uh, um, relay in close relation to the city. Or we could also uh, refer as another example of new types of urban climate phenomena to New Delhi and with this melting asphalt during summertime. So many cities, particularly in South Asia and the Middle East are encountering meanwhile temperature rates at 50 
degrees Celsius, which of course causes enormous amounts of stress for people, but also for plants and animals. And we could also talk about Zurich more and more, not only discussing or more and more uh, being confronted to not only heat during winter, but also to cool during summer. So we have a new type of development and, and also new types of challenges uh, in the field of climate control, challenging our current state of approaching um, the urban climatic conditions. So, uh, of course, uh, climate control, the practice as it evolved over the course of the 20th century and climate change are closely interlinked, as you all know, and this led uh, environmental sociol sociologist Elizabeth Schoff uh, uh, to this, uh, I think, remarkable and pregnant uh, quote. So she says the resources consumed in managing the indoor environment are ironically one of the more significant causes of outdoor environmental change. So there's, of course, a mutual reaction which has to be uh, reflected today. And if we look at uh, the current state, how cities are developed, uh, think of Dubai, we would encounter uh, buildings which are um, isolated, conceived as isolated entities, well-tempered environments, nevertheless isolated. So every building has been um, developed individually without any relation to the neighboring buildings and more broadly to the outdoor context. So um, there is a clear separation and between inside and outside and also a strong dichotomy, of course, between the two realms inside and outside and with energy efficiency as the pivot of the architectural and technological concepts. And also, I must say, the ecology movement as it evolved uh, in the second half of the 20th century, since the 1960s, kind of followed this path to develop isolated buildings when it comes to climate issues. So they promoted buildings conceived as autonomous, self-sufficient houses, if possible, even in the countryside, far away from the bad, ugly uh, uh, city and polluted city. So to end with this uh, preliminary remarks, I, I would simply like to remind you that there is, or from my point of view, there is a certain implicit correspondence between theory and practice. So we are kind of used to discuss, to address, to highlight individual buildings without, however, really considering um, groups of buildings and the larger context of buildings. And um, I think Fumi Komaki, the uh, Japanese architectural theorist and architect, perfectly recognized this fact already uh, in the mid 1960s and with relation to architectural theory. So he says that um, there is a complete absence of any coherent theory beyond the one of single buildings. We have so long accustomed ourselves to conceiving of buildings as separate entities that today we suffer from an inadequacy of spatial language to make meaningful environment. So far, these preliminary remarks on wicked problems. And I would like to now uh, introduce in the two trajectories of our research project, um, as I said, uh, the first one basically being a history of ideas and the second one uh, being a comp comparative study, uh, an empirical study, a small selection of, of case studies related to contemporary cities. And I would like to start with the historical uh, part of our uh, project, uh, the history of ideas, which is kind of um, 
scrutinizing design approaches to urban climates. And if we look at the 20th century, uh, we certainly have to, first of all, to state that uh, there was a core evolution, both of urban climatology as a science and of modern architecture and modern urban planning. So in the first half of 20th century, in particular, since the 1920s and 30s. And of course, both urban climatology and modern architecture and urban planning were participating in this overall discussion on hygiene and health. And uh, just as a side note, remarkably, this discussion comes back today, as you have probably noticed. So they were part of the discussion on hygiene and health with artificial climate, das künstliche Klima in German, as kind of the pivot of discussion and also kind of an intersection where urban climatology and modern architecture met. And then, of course, in the second half of the century, more and more comfort and energy issues were replacing uh, questions around hygiene and health. And so discussing urban climate issues was primarily developing um, new types of energy landscapes. So um, in, the, in these discussions at the beginning of the 20th century, of course, uh, also the existing city was part of the considerations. Uh, think of Barcelona also with a very particular setting in, in this type of urban quarter, of course, uh, with uh, having uh, a specific type of urban blocks and um, of course, we can discuss uh, the winds, how they were directed by the street grid, uh, the logic also of the heights of the buildings, how they were uh, relating to each other, the attic story, um, the, the courtyards, how they, with their greeneries, are influencing the microclimatic conditions. These are this is, of course, one, let's say, example how urban climate issues um, have been discussed or also another pre-modern or even pre-industrial uh, example taken from Siena, this beautiful uh, water source in the public space, um, also in combination with this niche, maybe accelerating uh, the wind flow. So another example how urban climatic conditions uh, kind of become visible in design processes, or also the famous passages of Paris, uh, you might know them, um, also providing a very particular type of microclimatic conditions, uh, kind of a greenhouse, maybe a microclimate, uh, an intermediate space uh, between inside and outside, nevertheless, uh, a public space. So these are kind of pre-modern uh, examples. And um, just to maybe mention very quickly, the, the major innovations of, of urban climatology was certainly to focus at the beginning of the 20th century uh, to the climatic conditions near the ground. This is also a title of a very influential book promoting microclimatology as a new type of, of of understanding. So climatology started to look not only, let's say, large scale at the climatic developments on a territorial scale, but they really scrutinized the, the microclimatic conditions near the ground, two meters above the ground or 10, 20 or 50 meters above the ground. And they started also with empirical means to measure not only the difference between city and countryside, but also the vast variety of urban microclimates throughout the city, in this case, taken from Vienna. So depending on the arrangement of the buildings, um, you would have uh, a different, let's say, type of temperature profile. So there, in this case, they were uh, comparing a broad plaza, a narrow alley, and uh, a broad street uh, with, with trees. And most maybe important uh, from my point of view 
is nevertheless their, the interest at the beginning of the 20th century in the 1920s and 30s in larger entities. So they, the climatologists, but also architects being interested in urban climatic issues were looking at, for instance, the urban block as the basic climate unit of the city. So not only the individual building was considered, but more broadly how the building is kind of located in the broad framework of the city. And here are a few quotes from one of the <clears throat> important books from uh, of this development, uh, Wilhelm Schmitz and Ernst Brezina's book, Das Künstliche Klima in der Umgebung des Menschen. So these two climatologists were talking about the study of climatic impacts of buildings as kind of the intellectual basis of design. And they were kind of talking about the mutual proximity of the individual houses and as they strongly influence the climate of the neighboring house and that of the opposite houses. So the climate of each urban block and the opportunity to improve it depends so much on the location and composition of the buildings throughout the neighborhood. So there was certainly a great awareness for this interdependency of the buildings. And I think this approach um, has been abandoned uh, in the second half of the 20th century. And let me now quickly give you a few examples how architects start to kind of rely on these approaches and this new type of thinking um, in, in the field of urban climatology. And here are two diagrams being really representative and kind of in a nutshell presenting the overall idea uh, taken from William Atkinson's The Orientation of Buildings or Planning for Sunlight, showing how solar access is of course, uh, solar access in, in an apartment is widely dependent on uh, of course, the neighboring buildings, how this building might uh, cast uh, shadows in the streets and to the facades of the neighboring house. And also, uh, of course, the height of the apartments uh, affects widely uh, the climatic conditions uh, within the apartments. And so, kind of starting with this kind of systematic analysis, um, we find, of course, a vast number of, of attempts to, to kind of dealing with um, urban microclimatic conditions to, to, to propose new types of urban developments. And here's a patent uh, submitted by Peter Behrens in 1930, proposing pyramids, terraced pyramids, instead of ordinary blocks and there they are even shifted to provide the maximum of sunlight in the apartments or uh, Ludwig Hildesheim really one of the most important architects when it comes to urban climate issues in the first half of 20th century he has a proposal for the for a new um, urban development in the city center of Berlin uh, so again um, providing larger developments also with the attempt to, to kind of overcome the single house system, as he says, so new types of large high-rise uh, row buildings and, and also, uh, of course, uh, in a new way, um, let's say ventilated and also providing solar access. So for Ludwig Hildesheim, the urban climate was really uh, one of the main influencing factors to, to kind of determine uh, the density of urban layouts. And another example, uh, Alexander Klein, Russian uh, German architect, also working in Berlin in the 1920s and early 30s, um, also experimenting with new types of typologies, in this case, honeycombed typologies, uh, again, to provide a maximum of sunlight within the small uh, apartments for the working class. And then maybe going to another area in Europe, um, Milan is certainly a, a particular 
interesting, let's say, city when it comes to uh, design approaches to, to urban microclimates. Here's an example of Asnago when they're uh, really uh, kind of experimenting with, uh, um, let's say, not closing the facade, but instead uh, kind of introducing kind of a courtyard situation, an, an urban void, uh, providing uh, sunlight from different sites, uh, also introducing an attic story, uh, experimenting with different sizes of openings. So there are many relations to, let's say, the neighboring context in this case, and also with large implications uh, for how to design a variety uh, and uh, a variety of microclimates in a conscious way. Or we could also, again, go back to Vienna and uh, uh, highlight Hermann Czech's proposal for a terrace large scale development for the seventh district of Vienna. So also tying in in this entire tradition of Vienna to promote uh, terrace houses uh, was already launched by Adolf Loos in the 1910s and 20s. And then <clears throat> maybe a last example from the US, uh, Ralph Knowles, really one of the most important, um, let's say, promoters of a heliomorphic design tradition and also conducting extensive research with his students um, uh, in the in framework of his studios, exploring how um, individual, individual buildings should be shaped in order to provide maximum sunlight for, for all the buildings uh, on a, in a certain area. And he was really uh, extending, extending these, uh, let's say, investigations also to the, let's say, political and uh, legal aspects, so how to introduce new types of zoning, uh, providing the access and, and of course closely linked to his investigations um, um, on, on, uh, on the design level. So, and certainly kind of associated with these developments also, um, this evidence-based approaches, we could say, to urban climate issues in architecture, we, we have to refer also to more experimental and scientific approaches in the second half of the 20th century. So using um, simulation techniques, in this case, still uh, physical wind tunnels in order to kind of simulate um, specific urban conditions, but also um, the implications of a particular architectural implications for this existing, uh, already existing microclimatic conditions in an urban district. So uh, design and regulation are closely interlinked, I would like to emphasize, and you certainly notice that to involve more than one building is a complex endeavor, which involves both design and regulation. So um, usually the architectural form is rather driven, let's say, by economy or aesthetics rather than by urban climate. And uh, uh, so there's a certain indifference to the climatic factors. And uh, buildings are maybe randomly located and shaped. And also the zoning practices usually do not respond so far to the urban climatic conditions, so solar and thermal impacts of buildings, the building height, the orientation, the materialization are not considered so far in many cases. Of course, this is now a, a, an evolving topic also in Switzerland and also in Zurich, but I would say we are still at the quite, um, let's say, primitive or uh, early stage of discussion. So there's a need to kind of reinvent urban regulations and together with design processes. So to end uh, this, uh, I maybe would like to simply uh, again refer to Ralph Knowles who kind of recognized these aspects already in the 1970s and early 80s. So 
Um, he says the way buildings interact with each other is usually not planned and remains a matter of circumstance that results from a rapid rate of change based on short-term profit. But form and the interactions resulting from location can be used to mitigate the effects of daily and seasonal insulation. In modern building, they could replace some of the need for uh, mechanical support systems. And of course, this is the promise, let's say, to conceive and to consider urban climates in the context of urban uh, built fabrics. So after this more, uh, let's say, historical and uh, discussion of um, this notion of urban climate from the perspective of architecture, I would like to now highlight one particular uh, case studies, namely the heating practices in China's non-heating zone. And um, as I said, um, we are kind of highlighting four empirical case studies, mainly by ethnographic means. So the main topic is how to cope with urban climates in everyday life. And the cities are Geneva, Cairo, Santiago de Chile, and a very large city in China, Chongqing. So um, just to give you uh, an impression from Cairo, so this is a woman insulating the rooftop in the informal district of Cairo due to the, of course, increasing temperature rates, um, extremely hot summer conditions. And this woman, of course, she doesn't have any type of thermal infrastructures provided by the state. So she has to do it to find a solution by her own. But as I said, I would like to <clears throat> talk now about um, the city of Chongqing. This case study is, is mainly conducted uh, or <clears throat> investigated by one of our postdocs, Madeleine Kobe. I hope she's also with us now. So um, here's an image from Chongqing. It's currently conceived as one of the biggest cities of the world. It's a city without any type of officially provided heating infrastructure, although the city encounters quite cold winters. So we are interested how people do in their everyday life deal with the fact of not having um, thermal infrastructures or heating systems provided by the state. As you might know, there is this so-called great heating divide in China in the 1950s, the new China communist government, government decided to only provide the northern areas of the country with a district heating system, while in the southern part of China, it was forbidden to uh, kind of install heating system, although in the northern areas of the south, quite cold winters are uh, reality. And um, Chongqing is exactly located in this northern area of uh, southern China. So it uh, is confronted with very hot summers, but also with cold winters. And on the internet, you find a lot of cartoons like this one uh, showing two winter conditions in China. In the northern part, you would kind of sweating, uh, wearing a t-shirt in the overheated apartment. And then in the south, you, were, you would freeze and being in the bed because it's so cold. <clears throat> and of course, the, the, the communist government in the 1950s relied mainly on the expertise of Soviet, ex, uh, Soviet experts planners and engineers developing the district heating network uh, in northern China. But in, in the south, as I said, and also Shanghai is one of the cities 
uh, of the southern area, no thermal infrastructures are provided. And this, of course, raises a number of questions. How do people cope with these conditions? And here's <clears throat> um, uh, a quote from a an, an dweller uh, of Chongqing, uh, how he describes the winter conditions. It's a quote recorded by Madeleine Kobe. So asked whether he feels cold during winter indoors, he replied, well, it is okay. I use a blanket. I drink warm water. In addition, I stand up for cooking from time to time. This warms from the inside. In winter, I get up in the morning, work a bit. Around lunch, I am cooking. Then I am eating and only then I feel really warm. After that, I usually go out or sit down again and then I restart cooking. Look, here in the kitchen is a mobile hot plate. I sometimes put it on the table and then I put the food on it. So when the hot plate stands on the table, it also warms me a bit. Food is an important warming source. So this uh, quote certainly gives you a, a first impression how people go through winter times. And here's kind of the layout of this um, uh, urban dweller, Wu Song is his name. And you see uh, a variety of devices kind of um, uh, being involved in conditioning the climatic conditions within the apartment. So he uses uh, heating and air conditioning devices which would provide warm air or an infrared heater near to his bed. He uses also blankets and also electric blankets, uh, thermos, of course, uh, with hot water. So a wide variety of different sources and really uh, always in close relation to the body or to an individual room. So there's not the idea of an overall provided climatic condition throughout the apartment. So if we look at the working conditions during winter, somebody would have, as in this case on the left side, you see this image, somebody working at the table and having a heat source under the work table. And of course, also uh, have wearing his jacket. And what is kind of remarkable, and so not only um, the, the fact that no official uh, thermal infrastructures are provided, but um, also the buildings haven't been insulated until recently. So the vast majority of all buildings in Chongqing are not insulated. And the clothes play, of course, an important role. So you would wear the same clothes both inside and outside. And I think this kind of dynamic also relation between inside and outside, people would go out to have to encounter warmer conditions, uh, to have a bit of solar access during winter time. So in many cases, the apartments are colder than the outside conditions. And this is kind of a current state as you would encounter it in the city of Chongqing. So the vast major majority of the buildings are not insulated. They not comprise uh, heating infrastructures. And if we look kind of at a history of ideas, we could kind of relate uh, to this idea of the skyscraper as a, as, as a kind of stacked uh, variety of landscapes. So different landscapes um, with, of course, also outdoor conditions within. And the image uh, on the left is taken from Delirious New York, as you might know. And on the right, another example kind of uh, a development of this idea by the architecture and environmental collective side in the early uh, 1980s. Or we could also refer to kind of heat open, uh, open rooms, rooms which are opened to the outside conditions. Uh, this is the famous open air school uh, designed by Johannes Duiker, which also promoted these ideas in the context 
of schools, or we could also refer to Richard Neutra. And I mean, he, he attempted to develop this idea of conditioning outdoor situations in many projects. In this case, it's the Kaufmann Desert House, which comprises a pool area, which is mechanically cooled and heated, depending on season and daytime. So in general, we could state kind of a reversal of the thermal conditions and how, as we would maybe encounter it in dreams or in the case of this movie, famous movie of Andrei Tarkovsky, Stalker. So encountering the outside conditions within, it's kind of a reversal, what we think uh, is kind of normal. So there's a greater interdependence between inside and outside conditions. So, but what is the debate in China currently? And of course, there is an ongoing debate about the need to also install a second district heating network in China. Here's a quote from Global Times, um, uh, a state-driven newspaper. And Xu Meng, uh, the journalist, says, in every winter, I fantasized about a world where southern part of China also had their own heating system. Last year, I discovered that I wasn't the only one who felt this way. The question of whether there should be public heat in southern China has become quite a hot topic." End of quote. So there are, of course, a growing uh, group of people really uh, asking for this second large-scale district heating network in China. And here are some arguments with why the district heating system should not be repli replicated in China South, kind of showing also the variety of arguments being in the public discussion. So they talk about the habits uh, and, and saying people in the Southern area got used to the cold winter conditions, so it's not necessary. Or the design aspect, the summer matters, but not the winter. The architecture in the southern area has to focus on permeability and not on insulation, for instance. Or the relevance, the utilization rate of a district heating system in the south would be much lower, but the costs in order to install it are the same. Then, of course, the costs, high expenses for the pipeline facilities have to be expected due to southern geographic features, the south is mainly mountainous and hilly. And then the last and I think the most important point, high energy consumption can be expected in case of a fully equipped district heating system in the south. So uh, this is certainly also uh, a global con concern. So there are kind of two possibilities. Uh, on the one hand, we encounter a middle class more and more also installing heating sources in their apartments, apartments without insulation and maybe even with open windows during winter. And then we have the idea to uh, kind of install a second large scale, really territorial district heating system in the south. So this is more or less the, the dichotomical um, uh, let's say uh, realities which are discussed but I think it's really there is a great need to rethink heating in China's non-heating zone epistemologically so far architecture does not play a role within China's current thermal regime in the south it is rather a blind spot as I would say resulting from the focus on either large-scale infrastructure or individual apartments. And just to end this second strands of our investigations, there are certainly pioneering approaches also revealing the relevance of design and buildings for a sustainable energy supply in the non-heating zone. And just to mention three of them, I think it's certainly worth and important to reflect the need to connect inside and outside as, as we described it. So people are used to go inside and outside and even 
encounter outside conditions within the apartments. So this should also be the conceptual basis for the design, so to speak. So energy efficiency can't be the only, let's say, target of a designer's approach. Then certainly also the fact that a variety, a diversity of microclimates is already in the game, but of course designers can develop them further into a conscious uh, direction. And then maybe a third point, Chinese people in Southern, uh, people in Southern China are still willing to live at low temperatures, temperature rates compared with, let's say, European standards. And again, this has, of course, also uh, great uh, ecological implications, which should be considered and cultivated by the architect. And to end with, I simply would like to show you this uh, already quite famous project developed by Chinese architect Louis Yakun uh, in the city of Chengdu. It's also located in the so-called non-heating zone of China, so in the southern part. It's a metropolis, again, really a big city, and it's the project West Village Basis Yard, providing really a, a, an interesting variety of microclimates in different courtyards, uh, also using these ramps and promoting different levels and different public spaces. And I think also the provision of uh, nicely developed public spaces is so important during winter. So people want to go out and spend their time also outside of their apartment. So I'm almost at the end of my presentation and I would like to add some concluding remarks on our research project. So um, our research project aims at rethinking climate control, which is of course a key concern of the discipline of architecture through the lens of city climate phenomena and the associated architectural discourses. Of course, in our case, uh, by using historiographical and ethnographic methodologies Nevertheless, I think it's, of course, an interdisciplinary topic and uh, it's also necessary to develop a, a comprehensive and precise theoretical framework in order to develop further this topic, namely to what are architectural approaches, design-driven approaches to urban climate. So, of course, the research project contributes to the wider framework of uh, climate adaptation and long-term energy transition of cities. And so our, our research project, I think what is one of the maybe also really important insights, it's kind, of, it's kind of a reversal of the ordinary approaches to climate in architecture. Usually climate is considered as a simply influencing factor of architecture, but I think in the case of urban climate, it's exactly the other way around. Architecture is indeed producing the microclimatic conditions throughout the city. And I think it's up to the architects and the engineers to provide kind of conscious solutions and to really design the microclimates by designing the buildings and the urban fabric in general. So here are the research gaps uh, that we identified. So we think we really promote a dialectical understanding between inside and outside environmental conditions, aiming at overcoming the one-sided focus on either the well-tempered environments, thus the interiors, or focusing on meteorology and urban design and thus on exteriors. I think what we really have to rethink are the mutual reactions, is the dynamic relationship between inside and outside conditions. So in this sense, we are contributing to a systemic 
understanding of heat balance throughout the city, not only throughout an apartment or a building. I think we have to address new scales for producing and saving energy in the cities, integrating the apartment and the cityscape. But as I said, we are conceiving urban climates as a question of design or energy concerns as design concerns. In this sense, we would really uh, can contribute to a wider research into design-based approaches to urban climates. So to end with, um, I would like to a uh, few comments on the notion of climate control in cities. I think there's a need can do, to extend our understanding as it evolved over the course of the 20th century. So far, we are mainly focused on thermal structures, building envelopes or building services. But I think as our case studies show, we have to include also the thermal regimes. Think of southern part of China. So what are the governing thermal regimes? What are the standards? What are the zoning laws? And then we also have to include the thermal practices of the citizens, of the residents. So how they move around uh, over the course of the seasons, how they use their clothes to kind of cope with the climatic conditions. I think these aspects are important extensions to a current notion of climate control. Secondly, of course, when it comes to energy issues, infrastructure is the keyword. Um, so the network of pipelines bringing from the global hinterlands the energy sources we need in the city centers and also, of course, the building equipment within the buildings. But I also think we have to extend this understanding and also include the urban fabric in combination with the existing natural forces in the city in order to provide a broader understanding of energy landscapes in cities. And last but not least, when it comes to design approaches by architects, usually we are mainly focused on, let's say, top-down approaches by considering the environmental factors and the built structures of cities. But I also think we have to also include bottom-up approaches as we can recognize it in the sensorial experiences and the thermal practices of citizens. So this is my last slide. I talked about wicked problems in architecture in the light of new global risks and associated dilemmas. So providing at the same time a growing city, a just city and a green city architecture and its theory have to deal with new types of problems. And I think the consideration of the civil society and the variety of publics changes the nature of problems and leads to wicked problems in architecture. And as you noticed, I highlighted urban climate as an exemplary subject. So the consideration of groups of buildings is needed for energy conservation in built environments and thus also, um, let's say, a new understanding of the climatic interdependency of buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha, for this uh, very nice and very clear presentation. Now we have a few minutes um, for questions. Um, this is uh, to the audience. Um, if you want to pose a question, you have several choices. You can raise your hand and, and then I can call you or you can post it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, while you might be thinking about potential questions, I would go ahead with, with asking a question. Um, what I think is very interesting is, and I, I personally wasn't aware of, of that this, this issue of climate or this topic of climate has been around for such a long time in, in the architectural debate and in the urban design debate. Um, you showed examples um, how this has been discussed in the 30s of last century. Um, and of course, the, the pressing question is, um, why is there so little reflection in planning practices up to date? And do you think that will change or what would be leeways to change that in the future if we we follow what you've proposed that we need to consider this in a much stronger way. 
I think the, the simple answer is that fossil fuels have been too cheap in the second half of the 20th century. So it was really possible to, to, to kind of equip buildings with uh, mechanically cooled and heated building uh, uh, energy sources. And I think it's, this is, I think, the, the, the main reason. And now with the current debates on climate change, this will certainly change. But I also feel that we are still at the very beginning of a much broader uh, development to, to include other approaches than only focusing on individual buildings or only installing, let's say, a mechanically uh, driven uh, heating or cooling system. And uh, yeah, it will probably need time and also involve uh, a vast variety of, of stakeholders and, and disciplines also. And, and also, and, and this, is, this is what I would be interested in, obviously it needs a very different way of, of being able to grasp a climatic situation. And you showed this, this is a complex problem and it probably needs much more analytical means and tools to be able to even incorporate this into design and so far architectural practice has not been so strong on embedding these analytical tool sets. So would you see this as a position the architect or the urban designer should be able to incorporate or would you say, okay, this is, this is for example, this is an engineering task where someone needs to put this in. Mm -hmm. um, but you made a very nice point that this should kind of also drive design. So how should we go about this? Mm. I, I think so far it's really mainly an engineering task. I think when it comes to really to the analysis of complex urban situations or also complex geometries, as you all know, uh, it's so difficult to, to start a, a, a proper simulation. So, but nevertheless, there are already, of course, uh, simple simulation techniques which can be incorporated by architects. In the, in the long-term perspective, I really hope that there will be powerful tools which allow architect to, to kind of estimate what a particular design solution might imply for a given situation because this is really the problem it's not only about the mapping right we are constantly talking about the mapping of urban climates of urban heat islands but what we need to know as architects how our design intervention would transform the microclimatic conditions and that's why i really hope that uh, in the future new simulation techniques associated with more powerful computational, I don't know, solutions will provide these insights. But I, nevertheless, I think it, this is just one part, I think, and the other part is that the architect has to um, build up new types of competencies in the field of design. I think there are traditions we have to teach students in a new manner and architects also in, in Switzerland, as I know, and in Zurich, they more and more ask to, to kind of refer to the urban climate. But then they are looking at large scale maps and it's so difficult, as you, we discussed this, Arno, it's so difficult to have really proper information on the particular site, right? It's, it's, so there are a lot of contradictions and difficulties. And um, yeah, I, my impression is we are still at the very beginning of a, of a, of a broader development. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, questions from, from the audience popped up? Um, otherwise, I will just keep on asking questions because I have a couple of, <laughs> a couple of them. Um, so feel free to raise your hand. Um, um, I don't know, maybe I ask one. There's Fabio asking a question. Okay. Nobody Fabio. wants to ask. <laughs> I, I can go on forever. Thanks, Sasha, for the nice lecture. I, I was thinking, uh, just, I mean, uh, thinking of, of your example on China. Mm -hmm. uh, there you had a few statements that were pretty, you know, radical, and you were exposing different probably uh, observation and worldview. So this uh, inhabitant saying that, yeah, he would uh, appreciate a central heating and actually found out that he's not the only one. So really reflecting this natural vector towards, you know, comfort if you can afford it, because it's clear here in Europe, 
oil was cheap, but we were also getting rich after World War II. So at a certain point, it was not provided by government, like in China, maybe, China maybe. But you know, as, as soon as you made some money, one of the first thing you were buying a car and the central heating, you know, and then maybe uh, going to holidays, and you know, it's a, it's a normal trend. And then, and in a few slides later, you had more the analytical statement. The probably is more about you know, the government. <laughs> saying that uh, I mean it's a nice chance you know to avoid installing central heating because these guys back actually are already used to it you know and there is a fundamental contradiction there because uh, at this dimension it's not just about design or technology it's about culture you know it's a societal issue and we have we very know very much this uh, mechanism so it's much it's much easier to, to become vegetarian you know if you have spent 20 years eating too much meat, you know, then if you start, we're starving from hunger since, uh, you know, a few years uh, ago, you know, and these things are like, if you observe the deep cultural implication of, for, for example, heat uh, across the globe, if you go to, to um, Singapore or Hong Kong and see who's sitting outside, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in this climate, it's only American Europeans, Northern Europeans, you know, that were starving from cold for generations, have this encoded in their DNA. So they, they think this is a good thing, heat, you know. Mm -hmm. for, for, for Asians, this is, is terrific, you know, it's like, and then these things cannot just be, you know, have to be included into the design question. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yeah, I, I... I fully agree. I, I mean, it's more a comment, right, from your side. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can perfectly understand the Chinese middle class that they want to participate in this global thermal standard issues to have not only a cooling system during hot summers, but also having a heating system. And a lot of people in China can afford it. But I think there is an ecological dimension and the, even a global ecological dimension. It has such tremendous implications for the global world. What happens in China? Because there are like hundreds of millions, right? Going in a certain directions. And I think, uh, so starting to also heat during winter and in a certain way also abandon maybe this cultural dimension or cultural this tradition right to to cope with cold winters and i think when it comes to these ecological questions we should really be aware on the different levels so i think yeah on the one hand i can accept that they want to have a certain lifestyle but on the other hand as architects European architects or Chinese architects, we should ask ourselves how we can really make a progress by finding a sustainable solution of the 21st century. So not only of the so not only relying on 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 uh, developments of the of the 20th century. Yeah, I fully agree, but then we should really think of about how to make this thing extremely attractive and not just reasonable. You know, yeah. because they are very quickly reasonable. I think, I mean, I have, a, for example, a differentiated uh, inner climate in a living place. Isn't that a very attractive thing? But it's very attractive because we have spent, you know, our whole life in fully homogeneous, homogeneous, you know, and so we have this idea that having, a, you know, different temperatures, and this is part of our discourse, but it's very, you know, has to be made attractive also to people that were freezing until last winter, until last winter. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think this can be done, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not just the, the rationale of it, you know, making it attractive, it needs to provide more than that. Yeah, yeah. At the really personal great. level, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's where the architects come into the yeah. game. I think exactly. they have to invent these new types of traditions and also this kind of relating also to emotional, let's say, dimensions of... Yeah, it needs a narrative. And, and, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Right, are there other questions from the audience? If not, I would, uh, yeah, thank Sasha again very much for his contribution, his lecture. We had uh, uh, close to 100 listeners um, to your talk, which I think speaks also for itself. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone joining. Thank you so much. Um, and hope to see you next time again at the next uh, ETA series lecture. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.